Hi, I'm Pastor Eldrin Morrison, pastor of the Verit Memorial AME Zion Church, New Haven, Connecticut. You're about to go into one of our Sunday morning services. I pray that the worship will be inspiring to you, that the word will be relevant to your life. Please enjoy. God today for his presence here and uh, music ministry reminding us that we serve a wonderful God and if you have nothing uh, else to thank him for you ought to thank him for waking you up this morning starting you on your way and his name is wonderful I was uh, sharing with the 930 worship service because I have I have some friends who um, who who sit in great churches throughout our denomination and they're always trying to track the mobility of ministers working their way through the denomination and and we were talking and 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 one said you know you ought to go here you or well, you can go to that church. I said, y'all ain't got no church to put me in. I'm, I'm where I am. And, and I invite them. Every now and then I'll invite one or two of them to come by and preach. One of them uh, is DeAndre James Daniels. And, and he said, he, Elgin, whenever you leave there, just let me know. I'll be there. I said, oh, you're going to be waiting a long time, brother. You better find somewhere. Better find somewhere to go. But there is no doubt about it that uh, God is blessing us. And, uh, and, and I'm telling you, if, if I wasn't a member of Eric, I'd join Eric today. I play out here. It's a good place to be. Good place to be. And, and I'm telling you, God is doing some great things in our midst. I mean, uh, not only is God blessing us in terms of our worship experiences, but uh, because we've been so devoted and so, uh, so focused on uh, making sure that the gospel is being spread in more ways than preaching, uh, more ways than just being inside the sanctuary, God is blessing us in terms uh, of, of being able to reach out and do some ministries that really make a big difference in our community, such as starting brand new charter school and this week we were able to meet with over 120 parents who are enrolling their children in kindergarten and first grade of the Booker T. Washington uh, Charter School and we're adding on other grades even with all that happened God is still blessing us and we're able to start this September. Amen. Amen. Uh, God is just good. And, and I want you to know that um, I, I had an opportunity to meet a person who said, uh, Pastor, and I'm going to tell you how he did it. I'm, I'm going to write a check for $100,000 for your school. And he didn't even blink about it. It was just, it was just like he said, uh, I'm going to give you $5. You know, that ain't nothing for us. But this man said, I'm going to write you a check for $100,000 for your school. And, um, oh, that ain't the best news. Let me tell you what else. He called back and said, no, I've been to your service. I know what you're trying to do in the community. I'm writing you a check for $150,000. I about cut up on the phone, I'll tell you. Uh, so, so even with all that's going on, God is still sending people by to bless the work that we're putting our hands to. You, you can't tell me what God can't do. You, you can't tell me that God, and if God has given you a vision, you ought to go with that vision. No matter how hard it gets, you go with it. And God will send people your way with the resources you need to make sure that vision carries through. Amen? Amen. Amen. Before I preach that, let me get to what I came to preach anyway. 
Uh, John, the 11th chapter, we've been working our way through the miracles of Christ, doing the miracles of, of Jesus. And this was just supposed to be a, a New Year's kind of uh, series, and it has lasted most of, of the year. And so we're, we're working our way, and we're almost at the end of this series. And uh, God has been blessing us. And today I want to call your attention to verse 38. We'll begin with verse 38. Uh, which is probably one of the hardest miracles to preach and to teach on is where Jesus raises his friend uh, Lazarus from the dead. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb when it was, it was a cave where a stone had laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by, by this time there is a bad odor for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Some translations say, loose him and let him go. And today I want to preach about the faith to show Jesus where you buried it. The faith it takes to show Jesus where you buried it. Pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity and privilege to be in your house we pray now, God, for a word that might speak to the hidden depths and places of our lives, that we might know where you're working, and we might be able to trust you and surrender our lives to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody had to be thinking the same thing four days later when Jesus finally arrived in the city of Bethany. Everybody also knew the news about Lazarus' sickness and his death and how it had reached Jesus in time for him to be in Bethany long before he showed up. And it's only natural that there would be a lot of emotional tension and a lot of hermeneutic of suspicion about Jesus' loyalty to this devoted family. Lazarus had been his friend and his brother beloved. And so much so that many people who wanted Jesus dead also wanted to kill Lazarus because of how close he was and how much influence he had in the kingdom of God. Now, Mary and Martha have their chance to state their opinion about Jesus' late arrival. Both sisters suggest that things would have been different had Jesus gotten there a lot sooner. Both of them say that Lazarus would have not have had to hold on to life so long before he died had Jesus got there sooner. They both admit that Lazarus would not have died at all had Jesus had been there when they sent for him. And we know that Jesus waited four days so that the glory of God could be clearly revealed and discerned in their situation. Jesus did not want any doubt as to who intervened in Lazarus's life. And the clear message of the kingdom from this whole situation is that no matter how bad life gets, no matter how late the arrival of your deliverance is, whenever Jesus shows up, you can be certain that he will be there to turn things around. Jesus knew that Mary and Martha had enough faith to send for him when Lazarus first took ill. When symptoms grew worse and when uh, he swiftly declined, Mary and Martha still did not waver in their faith, their trust, or their belief that if Jesus could just get there, I mean, he, he could make a difference in his life if he could just get there. And how, However, what Jesus wants to examine and what Jesus wants to reveal in these two disciple sisters, Mary and Martha, is he wants to measure how far their faith can go, how far their love and their devotion can stretch. Here's the verse that transitions into the greatest challenge that many of us face in our private and personal walks with Jesus. After Mary and Martha's Jesus if you had been here speech, Jesus offers them a place to rest their faith. It's in verse 25. Jesus offers this same thing to us today. He says, I am the resurrection 
resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus offers this place for them to rest their faith. He says, believe in me and resurrection is coming for your brother Lazarus. That, that's the promise. That's the proclamation he makes. But then right after that promise, he makes them a challenge. Jesus says in verse 34, show me where you've laid him. He, he says, show me where you've taken him. Show me where you've buried him. And if you can spiritually be courageous enough to present me what you have buried, what you have grieved, what you have mourned, if you have faith in me enough that is strong enough to stand with me in front of the places that the thing has died and been buried in your life, I will show you that I can make it live again. And I'm, I'm lifting this challenge up to you and I today because all of us have experienced some loss in our life, if not loss of a person, loss of something that was so important to us. And, and when Jesus delays his arrival, when we need him to come, we start asking some strange theological questions. We, we start asking things like, uh, I wonder if he can still hear prayer. Uh, why didn't he come when I called him? Or where is God now? It is not easy dealing with the literal pain and the emotional trauma. It comes from losing people who are important to you or losing things that are important to you. Lazarus brought balance to Mary and Martha's life. They, they clearly are two sisters with two different distinct personalities there and at times their two personalities are so diametrically opposed to each other that it causes irritation and aggravation that they try to get along and live in the same house you can imagine trying to live with two or three of your sisters can't you in the same house it, it causes aggravation the, the the enemies of jesus wanted wanted jesus dead and they wanted lazarus dead along with him because of the impact that Lazarus has on his community. It's easy to see that you don't have this kind of impact on the community and not have that same kind of impact on people who are living with you in your own home. You cannot be weak at home and strong outside without it at some point causing some problems for you. If you are all that on your job, then you need to go home and be all that in your home. Hello in here. I mean, if you're influential with your friends, then you ought to have that same influence with your kids. I can't get no help in here. If your neighborhood sings your praise, then the people in your house ought to be able to sing. Your, don't you be one way outside and one way in church and not be that same way back at home. <laughs> Lazarus's death means more than just uh, him dying and his sisters grieving him. It's more than just the absence of some spiritual male figure that was in their home. But, but, but this means the loss of what brought balance, what brought stability for two opposing personalities to live in one space. And many, many of us have experienced this kind of loss in our lives. If not the loss of a person, then we know what it's like to grieve the loss of something that's important to us in our lives. May, maybe it's something that life has stripped away from us or that stress has taken from us or disappointment has caused us or fear has frozen from us or anger has gripped from us and Jesus did not come and deal with it like we wanted him to do. And this causes anger to build up in us and we become angry with God. And, and, and whenever, I need to tell you that whenever that the Lord delays his coming, it is not because that God is upset with you. It's not because Jesus has forgotten about you or he has become absent-minded to the trauma and trouble of your life. In fact, when he delays his coming, he is trying to increase your faith. He is trying to mature your faith. He is trying to challenge your faith. Jesus is trying to stretch and conform your faith to make you into the man or woman you need to be to handle life and to be able to fulfill purpose in the places that he wants to bless you in order to occupy. You need to know today that when Jesus delays his coming, it's because there is something that he wants to do in you, around you, or for you that once it's done, wherever you are, and whenever there's a delay in your life, you will not give up, but you'll be able to rear back on your faith and say I'm not giving up I'm not going to 
going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to sit here and pout and cry. I may not have it right now, but it's delayed, but I know it's going to come. He may not come when I want him to come, but the Lord is always. So, Jesus wants to know, when he shows up, can you show him where you've laid Lazarus? Can you show him where you buried your good mood? <laughs> if Lazarus is your connection to peace, serenity, and, and, and stability, and relational unity, and Lazarus' death means the absence of the stabilizer, then things in your life are unstable right now. Jesus says, I could have shown up and healed him when he first got sick. But I arrived and I waited and I held and delayed my arrival until Lazarus was dead and buried because when I show up, I want to know if you've got the faith not just to show me what is sick in your life, but show me what is dead and buried in your life. Because I know that what's dead is important. I know it was stability. I know it caused stability in your situation, but I'm here to ask you today, Varick, when Jesus shows up, can you show him where you lay your good mood? Uh, why? Because you let people and situations rob you of your peace and your joy in life. Can you show Jesus where you laid your trust? Because now that explains why you treat everybody with a hermeneutic of suspicion. Can you show Jesus where you laid and buried your joy? And that's the reason why nobody wants to be around you because you've been so hurt in the past you bear any expectation or anticipation of having a bright future and you sit you spend your time sucking in your business when Jesus shows up can you show him where you lay your aspirations your hopes and your dreams or your willingness to try something again and that's why you've been walking around trying to mess everybody else's life up because somebody came along and messed your life up but when Jesus shows up and he asks you where you laid it will you be able to walk him to that tomb and say Jesus Jesus, I buried it right here and trust him to resurrect it again. A few things from this text. I don't want to keep you long because I know some of us was at the Temptations concert last night. And, and I can't keep your attention too long. So, first thing from this text is Jesus is demonstrating that he is not a victim of time. When you read the whole passage, you'll see, you'll sense the opposition that Jesus is getting in this text uh, from those in this situation. Uh, and they're telling him that we can't show you where Lazarus is dead because it's too late. Jesus shows up four days after Lazarus died. He stays in this border city and they, they got word to him to come and, and he does not come. And, and you would think that if Jesus really loved Lazarus, that he would have shown up. In fact, when he gets there, Mary and Martha, they have attitudes. You, you know how we are, huh? And they say, now, Lord, it's good to see you, but if you had to come when we wanted you to come, my brother wouldn't have died. I mean, it's good to see you, but, 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 but you late, brother, you late. And, and Jesus said, we don't really need to talk about that. He says, I understand that you're on this emotional roller coaster. I understand that you're upset with me right now because I took so long. It took me four days to get here. And because you are bound by time and circumstances, you, you've concluded that because I'm here four days after Lazarus has died, you think that hope and possibility has died with him. But, but he says, Mary and Martha, you ought to know me better than that. He says, just show me where you lay him and, and listen to the opposition in verse 39 they say but Jesus he's been in the grave four days he stinks right now here's what they're saying they're saying Jesus if you had a wanted to do something you would have done it by now you've allowed too much time to lap between when we sent for you and when you finally showed up and now time has Lazarus in a place where we think that you can't do anything that will help him. Things have happened. Decomposition has set in. The worms have eaten his body. You and Jesus says, 
brothers and sisters, you must not have heard me the first time. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anybody who believes in me shall live again. He says, what I'm trying to tell you, Mary and Martha, is that you are victims of time. You are a victim of chronological situation. He says, but I am the creator of time. I, I'm not affected and bound by time like you are. Whenever I show up, it's never too late. And for somebody here, you came to church thinking it's too late. It's too late for any good to come out of this situation. It's too late for this thing to live again. I'm here to tell you, if you believe that, you can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But every believer in Christ knows now, no matter how long you've been unemployed, no matter how long the marriage has been on the rocks, no matter how long the kids been acting crazy, it is never too late when Jesus shows up. I came to tell you that when Jesus shows up, things will turn around. When Jesus shows up, change can happen. High five somebody tell me it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late for things to turn around. All you got to do is walk Jesus to where you're buried it and show him where you're leading. Second thing from this text, uh, second thing is, not only is Jesus not a victim of time, but the second thing is Jesus is not challenged by obstacles. He's not challenged by obstacles. When, when they get to the tomb, they walk him to the tomb. This is what Jesus, you need to write this, this is what he really says. He says, there will now be no barriers between you and what I'll resurrect. Get that now. There will be no barriers between you and what I resurrect. When they lay Lazarus in the tomb, they put a stone in the mouth of the tomb. The, the opening up, they, they rolled a stone into the opening of the cave or the tomb so, so that what had died that was so important to them, they buried it and they put a barrier, a stone, between them and what they had buried. It was important, yes, but they put that barrier between them and what they had buried because they want to protect the fact that it died. Hmm. They, 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 they don't want to have to deal with the fact that it's dead. They, they don't want to have to deal and relive the fact that now it stinks. Now it has an odor. It began because the community does not want to see what has died anymore. They, they don't want to smell what has died. So they put a barrier between what has died and what is still alive. And the real tragedy that we don't like to face and deal with oftentimes is when we have trouble in our lives, when things die, oftentimes what remains alive stinks worse than what died. Sometimes you got to be honest and just admit that life does stink. I mean, it does stink sometimes. When Jesus shows up, he says, Lazarus will live again. He gets to the tomb, verse 35 is that verse that all of us know. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And then verse 39 he says, take the stone away. Translation will say, roll the stone away. Jesus says this, he says, I want you to remove the barrier you have put between where you are and what has died. Oh, you didn't catch that. I, I want you to take away the barrier between where you are and what has died. You didn't catch it. He says, I want you to remove your bad attitude that's got you thinking that you are stuck for the rest of your life. I want you to remove your bad mood to take, that you take to your job every day because you think that you're working in a rut kind of job that you never did like, earning a check that is never enough money for you. I need you to remove that bad mood so that I can show you that I'm able to give you an advance on your career and I'm able to make sure that you bring home enough money to take care of all the things that you need to take care of. I can't do that until you remove it so I can show you the opportunity that I have for you. I need you to remove the nasty way you treat everybody since somebody messed around and mistreated you. You need to remove that so I can show you what I can do in your life. Jesus says I can resurrect things but first you got to move 
some things. Look at somebody, tell them, move some stuff, move some stuff. You got to move. I'm able to resurrect it. I'm able to make it live again, but you got to remove it. So I came by to tell somebody that, yes, sometimes we are our own worst enemy. So sometimes it's us keeping us from some bright tomorrow. Sometimes it's us keeping us from some bright future. And if you move the stone, the Lord will come in and resurrect some things. You need to move the stone. Stop soaking in a bad attitude. Move that stone. Stop being a perpetual pity party. Move that stone. You got to move some stuff so that God can step in and make it live again. And the last thing from this text, because I know some of us still got Papa was a rolling stone playing in our minds. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, somebody remember that one, uh-huh. Not a victim of time. Not challenged by obstacles. But the last thing, and I'm cutting across for you right here. Bondage is not an issue for Jesus. They get to the tomb. Jesus weeps. Ah, oh, I wish I had time to deal with that. The fact that it wasn't just Jesus crying, but he wept and he was weeping with Mary. The text says he was weeping with the other folk there. So, so not only are you crying, but Jesus is crying with you. I mean, that's some comfort right there. Jesus weeps with us. He, he goes through our trial. I wish I had some men that know that you ain't walking through the valley by yourself. Jesus will go through with you. He'll cry with you. to the tomb he weeps then he speaks across the dark chasm of death and he calls Lazarus out of dead and out of the tomb Lazarus comes out of the tomb verse 44 Lazarus is wrapped up in burial clothes death's gone he's got strips of linen wrapped around his body which means get this that his movement after his resurrection was restricted. Oh, you didn't catch it? Movement after resurrection was restricted. It's sad to have the pronouncement of freedom and still be walking in bondage. So Jesus said, no, I can't leave a child of mine like that. No, no, if I made sure that you're free, I'm going to take you out of the bondage. So he says, no, the disciple is going to live like that. So Jesus speaks and he says, loose him and let him go. And they take the linen and the bands and the strips off of Lazarus and Lazarus is free and he can walk like a natural man now. Lazarus was hopping out of the tomb. Oh, you didn't catch that. You didn't catch that. He was hopping because he was wrapped up and bound up in linen and death clothes. And, and I came to tell somebody who hopped your way to church today. You hopped up them 12 steps to get in church today. I came to tell you that you came to church bound because some of the stuff that you were wrapped up in. And you hopped your way in the church. I came to give you props first of all because at least you're in church. You might have had to hop your way and wrapped up here in church, but I'm glad you're here because I know there's some so-called Christian folk that are looking at you, wondering why you are wrapped up in church. They looking at you like they ain't never been wrapped up in nothing or they never hopped themselves out of some bad situations. The devil is a lion here today. You ain't the only one wrapped up. Some of us been wrapped up since we got saved. Wrapped up in wrapped up in jealousy and wrapped up in fear and some of us been wrapped up in somebody else's sheets but whatever you're wrapped up in I'm glad you're here at least you're here with your wrapped up self so you can hear Jesus say he who the son has set free is free indeed I wish you'd lean on somebody tell him loose here loose here God is saying, lose him and let him go. Shout yes. Is there anybody here that's glad you're free? No longer bound. No more chains holding you. No more shackles. No more chains. No more bondage. Shout I'm free. <laughs>
from depression. I'm loosening from oppression. I'm, I'm loosening from suicidal thoughts. I'm, I'm loosening some things in your life. I'm loosening you from the spirit of death. I'm loosening some things. And you are now free. You're free to live. You are free to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Everybody standing with me in this place, you are free. I came to give you that pronouncement today that you're not going to be resurrected and bound. You're, you're not going to be saved and be living in bondage. You're going to be free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I pray that you enjoyed the message today. I pray that it touched your heart and your spirit, that it was relevant to your life. We would love to have you here at Verick Memorial Church. If you want to attend our services, please feel free to come by any Sunday morning at 7.30, 9.30, and 11.30 a.m. services. Our church is located at 242 Dixwell Avenue. We'd love to have you here at Verick. God bless.